When it comes to effort and muscle growth, you'll often hear a one-liner piece of advice that says you must train hard in order to grow muscle. Blood, sweat, and tears, baby. And while I do not disagree with the sentiment, it's vague and can be misleading. So how hard do we really need to be training? And throughout the course of that amorphous term, hard, where specifically does muscle growth occur? If we can answer this question, then we can apply our intensity precisely and efficiently. And that is where the stimulating reps model shines. At its core, what this model suggests is that in the context of a single strength training set taken to failure, the last four to six reps are the ones that are responsible for stimulating growth. But if your understanding just stops there, oh, the last five reps, then you can grossly misapply it to your training. A deeper understanding, however, can be extremely valuable. So in this video, we're going to discuss all things stimulating reps model. What makes those reps special? We'll talk about the physiology driving that. We'll talk about common misconceptions and misunderstandings. And then lastly, and most importantly, we'll discuss practical takeaways that you can apply to your strength training sessions. Because if you cannot apply theory, then the theory is useless. My name is Amir Barber. I'm a chemical engineer and a fitness educator. And today we're talking about stimulating reps. A little bit of background on this model. We love touching a little bit of history. Borges Fajerli initially put this model forth and it was called the effective reps model. And it was later refined and popularized by Chris Beardsley. But the models essentially say the same thing. That in the context of a single strength training set in an unfatigued state, taken to failure, the last four to six reps are the ones responsible for growth. Those are the effective reps or the stimulating reps. So for simplicity, let's just call it five reps. If we were to be doing a 12 rep max on biceps curls in which we perform 12 reps and fail, what the model suggests is that those first seven reps are more or less a warm up without much growth stimulus. And those last five reps, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12 are where the vast majority of the growth occurs or is at least triggered. And real quick, I want to emphasize the qualifying statement of in the context of a single strength training set taken to failure in an unfatigued state, because all of those chunks are very important and we will revisit those. From a physiological standpoint, these last five reps have two special things going on. First, we have a slowing of the contraction velocity, which is how fast the muscles are actually contracting. And this is important because of the force velocity relationship. So that's number one. Number two is we have a high degree of motor unit recruitment, which means a large percentage of the muscle fibers in the target muscle are activated. And both of these need to happen at the same time. So let's break these concepts down one by one, starting with contraction velocity. Before we dive in, it's important to note that the main driver of muscle growth is mechanical tension on the muscle fiber level. Now, the relationship that describes how much mechanical tension a muscle fiber is experiencing based on how fast it's contracting is known as the force velocity relationship. And what we find when we look at this relationship or this graph is that as contraction speeds slow down, the amount of force or tension on the individual muscle fiber increases. So slower contraction speeds mean higher tension on the individual fiber. But here's the catch. For a fiber to even begin contracting and experiencing mechanical tension, it needs to be activated by your brain. And that's where motor unit recruitment comes into play. So what is motor unit recruitment? Well, this can be a whole video in and of itself, but at a surface level, it can be described as a percentage of your total muscle fibers that are actually turned on and contracting. So if I had 90% motor unit recruitment, then 90% of all of my muscle fibers, let's say in my biceps, would be turned on. Now this begs the question, what is a motor unit? Well, we have thousands of muscle fibers within a single muscle, and it would be a logistical nightmare for your brain to control each muscle fiber individually. So what it does to make its job easier is it bundles these muscle fibers into bundles <laughs> known as motor units. Now, some of these bundles are very small, radially, and those are used for day-to-day -day tasks. But we also have larger motor units that are reserved for more demanding tasks. 
Now, the way your brain actually recruits these motor units or turns them on is according to something called Henneman's size principle. And what this principle states is that we recruit motor units in order from smallest to largest based on the level of central motor command, which is basically the size of the electrical signal that is sent to the muscles. Stick with me here. This is the last bit of physiology, and then I promise it's all easy from here. Okay, so the first 50% of your muscle fibers are type 1 muscle fibers, and these are what are found in the smaller motor units, and these are generally used for day-to-day -day activities. Okay, so the first 30% of your muscle fibers are usually in healthy individuals already maxed out in terms of growth capacity just through daily activity, moving things, picking things up, things of that nature. Then the next 20% can be grown via training. However, the type 2 fibers are the next 50%, and these are the larger motor units, and they get larger and larger. And these type 2 fibers are where the vast majority of your muscle growth is going to occur. Now, your brain decides on how big that central motor command, that electrical signal, is going to be based on the level of effort that you are trying to apply. For example, if I were to just pick up this water bottle, I would not be sending a signal to max out motor unit recruitment. Otherwise, I would be whoop, launch it into the atmosphere, okay, if I were that strong. Okay, so maybe I have, let's just throw a number out there, 10% motor unit recruitment, okay? Something very low that is matched to the task. However, let's say that this water bottle weighed 100 pounds and I was just trying to pick it up like this, I would have to max out motor unit recruitment to lift it up, which is very closely correlated with effort. I'd apply a lot of effort, send a huge signal to do so, and therefore we would max out motor unit recruitment, assuming we're unfatigued and putting fatigue to the side. So when we tie these two concepts together, slow contraction velocities, which means high degrees of mechanical tension, the driver for muscle growth, on a single muscle fiber, paired with high degrees of motor unit recruitment, which makes sure all the muscle fibers are turned on in experiencing this slow contraction speed, okay? And here's a big misconception that I wanna get out of the way right now, okay? If you were to intentionally move slower, being like, yeah, slower contractions mean more mechanical tension. If you're intentionally moving slower, your effort is reduced. And if your effort is reduced, your motor unit recruitment is also reduced. So those muscle fibers, there's a portion of them that are not turned on and experiencing that mechanical tension. So the sweet spot needs to be an involuntary slowing down of contraction speed. You are pushing or pulling as hard as you can and against your will, that contraction speed is slowing down. Now, when we're considering a set where we've achieved five stimulating reps, let's say doing a five rep max, what the model suggests is that more or less each of these reps is created equally in terms of stimulus. So if I did one rep for my five rep max weight, I would get 20% of the stimulus. If I did two reps, I would get 40%, three reps, 60%, four reps, 80%, and five reps, all 100%. And again, this is specifically talking about the stimulus side of things, not the fatigue side of things. And these numbers aren't necessarily hard numbers. We can't be certain that each of these five reps gives you a clean 20% of the stimulus. It could be like 16, 18, 22, 24, so on and so forth. We'll never actually know, but it's a good thought anchor to help conceptualize the model and have a rough estimation. So if your understanding just stopped here, you might think that every single set has the potential for five stimulating reps. However, that's not the case. When we take a look at the model and we remember the qualifying statements of, in the context of a single strength training set, taken to failure in an unfatigued state, right? That changes as we start stacking sets on top of each other because now we're considering multiple sets. 
And the reason that this is so important to talk about is because as soon as we start doing multiple sets like we all actually do in the gym, fatigue enters the equation. And fatigue is a monster of a subject. We can go down a million different rabbit holes regarding this, but the large scale picture about it is what fatigue does is it impacts your ability to recruit motor units. For example, Let's say you do a brutal 20 rep set to failure on hack squats. If you've ever gotten anywhere near that, you know how taxing that is. And after that set to failure, you rest for 30 seconds, and then you go straight into another brutal set in which you hit failure. The difference on this second set is that we are severely impacted by the fatigue of the first set. So even though we hit failure, at the failure point in that second set, we were maybe only at 50, 60% of the motor unit recruitment that we achieved on that first set. Now the exact number doesn't matter, but we know that we're missing out on a lot of activation of those muscle fibers. And remember, what makes these reps effective is high degrees of motor unit recruitment and slowing down of the contraction velocity. So if half the muscle fibers that we had turned on in the previous set are no longer turned on, there's no way they're gonna experience growth. And on top of that, the highest threshold motor units, the biggest ones that get turned on, were never turned on because those were at the top end of the motor unit pool. So our growth stimulus from this second set was a small fraction of what it was on the first set. And that second set was brutal, was difficult, and was extremely painful but it wasn't necessarily effective. And this train of thought actually lines up really well with the outcome data that we have. So all of our explanations thus far have been more mechanistic in nature. We look at mechanisms of physiology and we try drawing conclusions. And this model aims to predict the outcomes. And then when we actually go and look at the studies that looked at strength training outcomes and hypertrophy outcomes, the model lines up really well and reliably predicts this and explains a lot of the results. So in one meta-analysis that we have that establishes a dose response curve between volume and muscle growth, we find that in order to get double the growth of just doing one set in a session, you have to do an additional five sets on top of that. So if this first hard set to failure achieved, let's say, one arbitrary unit of muscle growth. To get a whole other unit of muscle growth, we'd have to do five more sets to failure. That's an awful lot. And it lines up with the stimulating reps model because fatigue is going to limit the amount of motor unit recruitment that you get. So therefore, you will get less and less stimulating reps as you continue doing sets. So practically speaking, more sets does not equal more growth, and later sets will have fewer amounts of stimulating reps within them, especially if fatigue is not managed properly. And that's why if your understanding stops at the last five reps is what matters, you'd be pretty confused if you looked at the outcome data. So we definitely got into the weeds with a lot of theory. I hope you enjoyed it because I always like talking about it, but let's like zoom out, ground ourselves and be like, okay, what are we supposed to do in the gym? So let's just go back to set number one. When you understand that the last five reps in a set taken to failure are the ones that actually stimulate growth, that's a very convincing reason to push your sets very close to or to failure. Now, do you have to train to failure every single set? Absolutely not. I think one rep in reserve tends to be the sweet spot of managing stimulus and fatigue. If you'd like to hear me talk about that at length, Links in the description. But you do have to get close to failure. Otherwise, you're not achieving any of the stimulating reps. Now, this is where the model really helps. So rather than giving the vague advice of just, you know, go harder, blood, sweat, tears, right? We can actually quantify and rationalize this. If you do a strength training set and you leave four, five, six reps in the gas tank short of failure, then you're walking away from that set with almost no benefit. And that's exactly where most casual lifters fall short. They're leaving so many reps in the gas tank and just going through the motions. But if you have this numerical understanding and a rational explanation behind it, 
it will kick you in the butt to do better. And I've found myself saying this to clients, and when I explain it this way, their effort goes through the roof. You already showed up to the gym, you already warmed up, you already set up the exercise and learned how to do it, and you've already done the vast majority of the set. Give me 10 more seconds of effort, give me four more reps, and you will walk away with way better results. Now that is motivation. And the reason it's motivating, because it's not just suffering and going harder for the sake of suffering and going harder. This is calculated, this is precise. Another practical takeaway that comes from the deeper understanding of how fatigue interacts with the model is that more is not better, better is better. And that if you push your sets hard and close to failure with good form, you can get away with doing less volume and getting better outcomes. And if you can only make it to the gym for let's say 30 minutes, just do one working set of each one of your exercises and you still got the vast majority of the growth that you're gonna achieve in that session. Another thing to consider is the impact of fatigue on how stimulating your sets are. So if we want our sets to be more stimulating, then managing that fatigue is incredibly important. You'll notice earlier I used a brutal example of uh, compound movement, hack squats, very painful. We did high reps with a very short rest period, all of which induce a ton of fatigue. So practically speaking, here are some general guidelines that I'm not going to get way too into, okay? Take adequate rest periods, two to three minutes at least between working sets, depending on how big the movement pattern is. Let's say heavy barbell back squats, you might need more. Another way to manage fatigue is to stay on the lower end of the rep range. I love the six to 10 rep range, five is great too, but once you start going into like 15 plus reps, there's an argument to be made that there's a lot of fatigue generated there. Third, you should generally avoid supersetting, drop setting, or cutting your rest periods short because you need to recover in order to have high degrees of motor unit recruitment on that next set. So if you're anything like me, after learning about all this, you might have a lot of questions. And I'm going to address the most common ones, and I'm gonna rapid fire answer. Number one, why don't we do every set in the four to six rep range? Well. For some people, this can be an excellent approach, but depending on the individual, it might not be the best idea. For example, if I am working with a beginner who is not well acquainted with the movement, I will opt to do lower weight and a higher rep range. This gives us a chance to work on form, for them to be more comfortable uh, just with the weight in general, and also to actually get their reps in. They are literally doing more reps and practicing it more, so their coordination will improve quicker through repetition and through practice. Another case in which I'd opt for higher reps is if we have somebody with joint health issues in which going heavy bothers the joint in question. So let's say we're doing shoulder presses and if they start creeping up into the six to eight rep max territory, heavy loads, it just does not jive well with their shoulder. Then in that case, it's perfectly acceptable to just move into the higher end of the rep ranges and that's what's best for that individual. Question two, can I still grow with lighter weights? Yes, absolutely. Um, as long as you are still training close to failure, you can grow from lighter weights. That is, no one's debating that. However, what I would caution against, or my caveat on that, is that it can be less efficient because higher rep sets tend to generate much more fatigue as compared to lower rep sets. However, we do have good data showing growth outcomes from lighter weight. So I wouldn't say like it's an absolute no-no, it's just a question of efficiency. Question three, are all exercises equally good at giving me stimulating reps? I really wish you didn't ask this question because now we have to go down another rabbit hole, all right? Um, but the short answer is no, not all exercises are equally good at giving you those stimulating reps because Let's just say an exercise is very unstable and involves a lot of musculature, okay? So let's say we are doing a standing military press on a half BOSU ball. So we have to balance while we're doing this. Now, all of that coordination demand and mental focus on literally just staying upright is going to severely limit how much motor unit recruitment you can get out of the deltoids, therefore will limit the growth potential by limiting the amount of stimulating reps. 
And if you have any more questions, drop them down below. I will do my best to answer. Otherwise, thank you for watching and I hope you found this valuable. Peace.